Hello, everybody. My name is Grace Dammon, and I'm here with the team from Laguna Honda Hospital Pain Clinic. And we're going to talk for a long time about how we deal with chronic pain. Uh, those are all the team members. They're each going to talk for a little bit. I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes about my experience as both a patient and provider with chronic pain. And then each of them will come up. They're gifted practitioners. And they're going to explain their complementary modalities, how they use them, how they work effectively. And they will demonstrate. The primary thing that's important about all of us is we work as a team. And we've learned a lot about what works and doesn't work with chronic pain working as a team. That's what we hope to give you a sense of tonight, is the magic or the power that can happen both from a team approach and also from complementary treatments and modalities. This is non-opiate based, non-pharmacologic based. So I'd been a physician for many, many years. And I trained both, I did my medical training here, my residency training here. And the day was like any other day, in that I was driving my daughter home across the Golden Gate Bridge. And lo and behold, it was also like any other day, in that I was running very late. And I was late for a dental appointment. So unlike every other day, I drove in the middle lane, which is considered the suicide lane, you know, closest the on, to the oncoming traffic. Anyway, and lo and behold, even though there are 1.8 billion crossings since the bridge has been built, and there have only been 36 fatalities, 17 of which were head over head-on collisions. So the odds of get, being in a head-on collision is exactly zero, nonetheless. Somebody was driving in the opposite lane, the opposite way, and he went into atrial fibrillation, passed out at the wheel, crossed over three lanes of traffic, and hit my car right head-on in the driver's door. You can see. Nonetheless. So what happened to me medically, emotionally, cognitively, and professionally? Well, I spent 45 days in a coma, and I got 48 units of blood that day one, which is about five times my blood volume. And I spent, had three major brain bleeds, extensive DAI, diffuse axonal injury. I don't ever put that on the slides, because I don't think the legal department of the city and county would like to see that because I am still a doctor. Anyway, I had 13 surgeries in the first 13 days, five major operations later on. I spent 13 continuous months in a hospital. And I had two later TBIs. So it really wrecked havoc with my life. And I had to retool myself professionally when I actually went back to work three years later, because I was totally unable to do acute care medicine. So I turned to Buddhism. Now, why did I turn to Buddhism? That doesn't matter. But Buddhism is all about, well, I lived at Green Gulch Farm. Buddhism is all about four noble truths. First noble truth, the truth of suffering. What that means is, suffering caused by old age, sickness, and death. Second noble truth, we cause it by clinging or averting from stuff that we don't like. Third noble truth is the truth of that you can eliminate suffering. And the fourth noble truth is the truth of the path. So why Buddhism? Well, anyway, I had lived at Green Gulch, which is a Buddhist community, and I have figured that I had learned everything that I needed to learn to be able to go through the experience I was going through. I actually had had the best education that money could buy, but nobody had ever taught me about what goes on in my mind, how my mind can create reality. So that's what I was learning by sitting every morning from 5 to 7. And 
You know, at Green Gulch, we often do long sittings for seven days when we sit in the same place in the Zendo from 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. at night, eating and sitting in the same place. So on day four, it's hell for everybody, everybody. But everything changes. The hell only lasts a second, and then it's gone. Then you're in a bliss state. Everything changes. That's what I'd learned from being at Zen Center. And I learned true reality, which for me is written on this, what we call a han, this wooden block that calls all of us to meditation. And it says, wake up. Life is transitory, swiftly passing. Be aware of the great matter. Don't waste time. And in sitting position, your mind and body have a good power, a real great power, to accept things exactly as they are. And I had never been able to do that before. And also I met His Holiness, which I've got to say was a great event in my life. He really became, he's my hero, because I felt if he can be so, have so much equanimity in the face of such national tribal suffering that he's endured, that his people have endured. And if you can have such great joy, then practice, which means looking at the contents of your own mind, must be worth something. So I decided that it was really good because it could transform behavior. behavior. So what were my thoughts as a patient? The first thought, the most important for me, was that my own healing came about totally by being around happy people. I couldn't stand it. I would pull the covers up over my head. Whenever somebody depressed would, came into my room, I didn't care who they were. I would feign sleep. So our job is to help other people be as happy as we are at work. We have no business doing this work if we don't love it, meaning if we don't love the patient, love each other, love our teammates, love what our purpose is. And probably remember that the most important person to your patient, if they're in the hospital, is the certified nursing assistant, not you, the doctor. And probably if it's outpatient, it's the receptionist. It's whoever lights up when that person comes in the room. And take a long view on the time and meaning for recovery. It doesn't mean going back to living life as it was, but it does mean developing a creative, meaningful life that takes into account all of the limitations and possibilities, realities, given by current physical, emotional, and cognitive realities. What is helpful are tools to deal with pain, identity crises, not knowing, appreciating the smallest things, and constant change. And physicians are really bad at creating this or training people in these kind of activities. Often we forget first our biggest intention and why we're in it to begin with. For me and you as healthcare providers, remember our purpose. Try to figure out what mistakes we often make, make checklists to avoid them, and protecting others, doing no harm. And let's, by all means, try to impart to the next gener generation of healthcare providers our joy in doing what we do. In other words, teach your children well. So pain, what is it? It's always an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience, and it's always subjective. And it's unquestionably unpleasant, but it's therefore an emotional experience. This gives a short view of the neurology, physiology, and um, of pain. You should look at it in your online presentation. I'm not going to go through it here, but I'm just going to show it. This was the 14th century version of neurology of pain. 
somebody hit, you touch a hot um, fire and you pull back. That's the pathway. This is neurochemistry. These are propagation of pain stages. My team doesn't like it when I spend time looking at this mechanistically or scientifically, but I am somewhat of a science nerd, and I've got to say I like this. You don't have to like it. Just know that it's there. And this, it, the notes go completely through what you need to know if you're interested in the physiology and anatomy of pain. Now we come to the chronic pain cycle, and you can see that increased pain leads to anxiety, leads to sleeping problems, leads to not coping. Circle, circle, circle. And these are the factors that influence how pain is experienced. We all know these biological, psychological, and social. How people interact with you if you're in pain, how you're treated when you're in pain, how much you experience anxiety and fear when you're in pain. All of that matters. So th this theory, which is now not in vogue, I happen to love, so I've included it. And that's that pain is produced by the output of a widely distributed neural network, which we just saw back there. You can go back in your online notes and read about it. But it's genetically determined, and it's also modified by your sensory experience throughout your life. And pain is the output of this neural network and not a response to tissue damage. Chronic pain syndromes don't need to have anything to do with tissue damage. The brain is not fixed. It's not a fixed system, but rather it's neoplastic. And this just is summarizing all that I just said. So the Institute of Medicine, in, um, because so many people theoretically were suffering from chronic pain, a million people at that time, they now say it's closer to 200 million people, um, making its control of enormous value to society as well as the people suffering. They wrote up this wonderful report that's called Relieving Pain, a Blueprint for Transforming, blah, blah, blah. I can never remember what the blah, blah, blah was, but it's all about pain. And the pendulum was swinging because chronic pain and pain were being taken seriously. For example, our hospital was getting dinged, and I think many hospitals were getting dinged because we had too many people in it. We theoretically, were in a moderate to severe pain chronically. So that's part of why the pain clinic was funded. Now, initially, medicine decided to intervene pharmacologically. And you can see from this slide, opiates are mentioned in three of the four mechanistic sites of action. Um, they don't say anything about complementary medicine or complementary alternative treatments, like where does acupuncture influence or impact? And it does impact on many of those same sites. But medicine was only inter interested in the pharmacology. And so it's understandable why so many prescriptions were being written for opiates, because opiates were the only drug useful in treating chronic pain, or so it seemed at that time. And you can see it looks very much like the election, um, <laughs> the Trump election of 2016. I have to say that. Anyway, it just lights up. The purple areas are the areas of greatest opiate use, and they had about one prescription for every person in that state was written every year. So uh, Danny Ciccaroni is going to talk to you next week about the three waves and the rise of over opioid overdose death. But that was really the logical outcome of what happened. When we started the pain clinic in, I think we were in the beginning 
in the middle of the second wa wave. Um, and then you can see how astronomically it's rising up with other synthetic opioids, mostly fentanyl. Okay, and then this is national drug overdose deaths. I'm just astounded that 70,000 people died last year from overdose deaths. There were only 40,000 who died the year that we developed the clinic. The cause of accidental deaths in the United States in 2016, drug overdoses 64,000, gun deaths only 15,000. That I would not have expected. So this led to a federal response, and they called it an epidemic. And I'm not going to talk about most of it, except to say that the CDC did publish guidelines on the use of opiates for chronic non-malignant pain. Um, and we all have bought into them, subscribed to them, and they're hopelessly difficult to implement. And what have the guidelines taught us, given that we all subscribe to them? They've taught us that the evidence is insufficient for every clinical decision that a provider must make about the use of opioids for chronic pain. That's the long and the short of all of the work. So we began in June 2011, we began the pain clinic. And we, again, as I said before, it was mostly that Laguna Honda Hospital was under the um, mandate to do so, basically, by the uh, accrediting agency, which had knocked down our star rating. So therefore, the institution had tremendous interest in wanting to do something about pain. So that's what we were charged with. So what we do we try to do? This is what we're also trying to do now, providing a safe space and a therapeutic milieu using a team approach for creating wellness and a sense of well-being while patients learn to live with pain. Initially, we had a great staff. I mean, we still have a great staff, but we were heavily, heavily staffed in the beginning. We had three massage therapists, um, a pharmacist, a volunteer MD, volunteer now volunteer Buddhist chap, a MD acupuncturist, an advanced placement nurse, a social worker, music therapist, and many volunteers who provided complementary treatments. Patients were seen weekly in the beginning times eight, then bi-weekly for eight visits, then monthly for as long as we were making a difference. Either they could self-elect or we could self-elect to stop seeing each other. And we had just um, the only data I could look at recently was for calendar year 2014, 2014, and we had 89 patients with chronic non-malignant pain, and we provided 2,000 2,500 treatments for about 838 visits. Last year, we had 829 clinic visits. Amazing. Uh, as I said before, we're mostly providing complementary medical treatments. And this on the left shows you what they are. Biology-based, body-based, energy therapies, mind, body. And the picture on the right, which I think is really interesting, kind of points at the complexity of talking about the interrelationship between pain, emotion, and cognition. We all know that. Um, it's mostly that they're both top-down, bottom-up approaches. And top-down ones are um, start with the cerebral cortex and involve some kind of intention or thinking or thought structure or, in, you know, and they start from the top. And in the clinic, those forms of treatment are mostly meditation. Um, medical qigong, I consider prayer, singing, distraction we use a lot, laughter, 
All of those are top-down. Bottom-up modalities are basically touch-related. Acupuncture, acutonic, massage therapy, touch, holding hands. Complementary alternative medicine has the great benefit of being less risk adverse, meaning the liberal use of surgery and medications, mostly opiates, had really um, made everybody reconsider. And this is in the CDC guideline of not using opiates as a first line of treatment. The VA now demands that body-based therapies be used first. And mind-body medicine communicates, uh, brings it all together. And the whole system is neuroplastic, meaning the brain itself can rewire itself. The sensory apparatus can be rewired by intention, by training, by practice. And that's really important. It's also so cost-effective relative to anything else. And most CAM strategies work to disrupt pain pathways in much the same way as opiates do, but with uh, sometimes at different receptor sites, sometimes at the very same ones. But we haven't been studying it until just recently. So pain always has a threat response, meaning I think for our patient population, they are totally freaked out by pain most of the time. And bad trumps good, just remember that. Bad emotions, bad parents, bad feedback have much more impact than good emotions, good parenting, and good feedback. Bad information is processed more thoroughly. Bad impressions and stereotypes are quicker to form. So pain is a very acute bad thing that happens. So we all know this fight or flight mechanism that only adds more stress to the nervous system. But in fact, the nervous system is in its most creative best state when it's perfectly balanced, when the uh, autonomic, parasympathetic, and sympathetic nervous system are totally balanced. You can see this. You're calmly focused, alert. And this is the high performance zone. So pain and pleasure. Pleasure is so disruptive of pain pathway. It's wonderful. And this is really what we focus on in the clinic. We try to put pain in the place, or we try to put pleasure in the pace, place of pain, and thereby inhibiting pain pathways and receptors. And we do that by pleasant odors, pleasant music, pleasant speech, pleasant touch. Now, this is one of those nerdy um, <laughs> diagrams that my team also hates. But I love it just because it's showing uh, what happens when you put an acupuncture needle in someone. And it disrupts uh, the propagation of pain, both from the periphery to the brain and then back from the brain to the periphery. And it does that by activating what are called C fibers. C fibers um, go up the uh, pathway, pain pathway, and they hit the spinal cord center. And that's, those centers put out serotonin that in fact comes back to the dorsal horn, which is the primary relay station, and stops the receptor sensitivity to pain. So it down-regulates pain totally. What does meditation do? I mean, this is my big favorite. But John Kabat-Zinn did a much studying on um, how mindfulness-based meditation helps to reduce pain by parsing between the objective reality of pain, the objective sensory reality of pain, and how we parse that emotionally, what, how we label it emotionally. Um, for example, if you say that pain is bad, then you're just going to increase the pain. So what they did is they took uh, meditators in a non-meditative state, and they put them in functional MRIs. 
and they showed that non-meditators were much more sensitive to the pain itself, but they had way reduced, statistically reduced sensitivity to distorted body image, to present moment pain, to um, negative body image, to uh, activity-related back pain, to um, psychological uh, symptomatology like fear and anxiety, and they used less, fewer pain drugs. So that was the good thing about meditation. And then how does meditation change the brain? And it really changes it a lot because it enhances cognitive function by improving memory, sustained attention, monitoring, monitoring faculty to avoid mind wandering, perceptual abilities, slowing age-related cognitive decline, and it enhances emotional function by improving pro-social behavior. So they did a study at Harvard, and they took 16 people, which is not a very good sample, but they wanted to see if meditation in short term could change the brain in any way, just short term. And what they did is they gave everybody 45 minute guided meditation to do each day. And they also said, do whatever else you can do for mindfulness. And they looked at the brains. And this is before meditation and after meditation. And this is beta waves. Beta waves are really shown by when we're processing information. So in the second after meditation, the beta waves are way decreasing, especially in the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe is the most highly developed part of the nervous system. It's what controls emotion, memory, executive planning, keeping it together. So basically, with meditating, your frontal lobe goes offline. In other words, you stop processing. I've never had that experience. I've got to say, as much as we meditate, that isn't what I would say my experience has been. Anyway, so we then looked at our own clinic population to see uh, what if and how we were affecting them. And we decided to take one very simple measure, which is called the global impression of change. What you do is you ask people before and after they get treatment, how do you feel now? Do you feel better, worse, or the same? Very simple. Because in our experience, what made the most sense was that people, their global impression of change um, was the best predictor for whether or not they could use complementary treatments. And anyway, what we found was that 94% of the people who got any form of treatment felt better or much better after receiving treatment. Only 4% felt worse or the same. We had a big percentage, 23%, didn't answer the question. But nonetheless, it's good. And we had one physician said to us, oh my god, oh my god, I don't know what you guys did, but blank, the patient's name, said, I have been touched by angels when he came back from seeing you. I don't know what you did, but he felt totally seen, heard, touched. And he said, I'm no longer in pain. And he stopped using all his pain medication, except one breakthrough a day. And she said, you belong together. I'm going to send you guys adoption papers. <laughs> and no, we didn't adopt him. No, we're not the perfect par parents. But that was really a wonderful t time both for us and for him. So what are the underpinnings of happiness and well-being? Because this is also what we're trying to do, mostly. Sustain positive emotion, recovery from negative emotion, empathy, altruism, pro-social behavior, mindfulness, and less mind-wandering, less being pulled involuntarily by 
irrelevant emotional distractions. And the neural pathways in all of these four are plastic. So in other words, you can train the mind to be more happy, more with more sustained positive emotion. And that's what we do all the time. So what, finally, are my thoughts as a provider? Uh, virtually nobody said, I want to suffer. Staff included. Think about it. When have you heard a staff member say, I want to suffer? Work on the positive side, the do no harm side, with patients and staff alike. Realize that everyone thrives with a sense of purpose and recognize that we're all in this together. And it always takes a supportive village to achieve what is truly worthwhile. This will show the pain clinic. You'll get a real sense of what it's like. And then after this, each. various pain interventions. But what they really need is the community of people who support them in their process of working through their pain. Danny wanted to do acupuncture, and somebody else wanted to do massage. Somebody else wanted to do music therapy. Somebody else wanted to do painting. And we've got all of those things. We're trying to put something else in the place of pain. Most of all, we have a good time. We're not thinking about it anymore as a pain clinic. We're thinking about it as a way of relieving human suffering. Exercise your arms. You know, do the arm bicycles. Uh -huh. Because that really gets your heart running. Good. I think we're done for now. Good. And you'll get to go back into the room mm -hmm. and get your needles wherever. Right. And my massage. A few ideas for to follow up. I love that massage. I get my shoulders, yeah. my feet. Yeah. Feel so good. That is wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. So, right now, um, I'm going to leave this stand, and each member of the team is going to come up, briefly explain what they do. My name is Carolyn Tigg. I'm a massage therapist in the pain clinic. Um, and full disclosure, I'm also an employee here at UCSF. Uh, I work with the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. Um, I thought I would give a very brief case presentation and then even, even more brief uh, demonstration of the kind of work that we do, although the visuals in the video are um, probably actually more appropriate in, in the, the full thing. So that's really what it's like. Um, but the gentleman I wanted to share with you, um, DL, is a 57-year-old male who came to Laguna Honda about three years ago after a stroke. Um, the stroke was likely the result of poorly managed diabetes. Um, and he had a uh, below the knee amputation, um, as well as some right-sided weakness, um, slightly cognitive um, impairment. Um, and he ambulates in a wheelchair, so he has a lot of upper body stiffness and pain um, from just his, his daily activities. So for massage therapy, um, how we work with him, we all work with um, DL, but uh, with massage therapy, I tend to start with a very gentle shoulder, neck, um, head massage. The idea, again, as Grace said, um, to induce the parasympathetic nervous system, to interrupt those pathways of pain and remind the body that it can feel good. Um, and so that's how the massage tends to start. Um, with this gentleman, he has so much um, tension in his arm. I also tend to do a little myofascial release work, um, maybe even some strain, counter strain, um, which um, is, is very helpful for him. I think I thought of DL to bring um, to your attention because while he's not very verbal, um, he's very expressive. Uh, so he really um, has a wonderful kind of uh, vocalization of his appreciation of the work. So um, it's really an honor to work with him. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to kind of say about that particular case. But it's really, it's definitely an honor to work with Dr. Damon and all of the team. So really happy to be here with that. 
again, the, the massage starts very gently. Um, it's not about deep tissue and getting in there and range of motion and things like that, but just really calming the system down um, and offering some, some interruption to that pain, pain experience. So it looks something like this. Just a very brief demonstration of the work. Thanks so much. Good evening. I'm Sharon Brahms, and I'm a nurse massage therapist in the pain clinic with Dr. Grace and all these wonderful team members here. Uh, we recently received a grant that allowed us to teach these complementary therapies that we use in the pain clinic to the nursing staff and the certified nurses assistants uh, throughout the hospital. And our goal in teaching these uh, staff the mod modalities was not only to give them the tools so that they could reduce their stress and the patients, but also provide them with the opportunity to do more hands-on uh, therapeutic touch with the patients. So in addition to massage, we also taught them deep breathing techniques, which also reduces pain. And uh, then we taught them the many benefits of aromatherapy. And aromatherapy is the use of essential oils that are derived from plants to bring balance in, to the body and mind. And they have been used as medicine throughout, for thousands of years throughout Egypt, Asia, followed by Europe, and more recently in the United States. And many of the essential oils have antimicrobial properties, meaning that they are helpful in fighting bacteria, viruses, and fungus. There are three ways to use essential oils, and the best way is the direct inhalation. They can also be put in a diffuser or put a few drops in the um, lotion and then apply it to the skin. So the oils um, are so small, the molecules are so small that they can cross the blood-brain barrier. So that, therefore, the oils act on the limbic part of the brain that deals with memories and emotions. And then they elicit a variety of responses. So some of the common oils that we showed them was lavender that most people are familiar with. It's very calming, relaxing, can help with insomnia, insect bites, um, and headaches. It's also good for colds and flu. The other one is peppermint, which is very uplifting, energizing, helps with concentration, and helps with headaches, digestion, nausea uh, induced even by chemotherapy, and eases congestion. And I keep a bottle in my car because if I drive long distances, I tend to get sleepy, so I just open up the bottle and use a little bit of peppermint rather than so much caffeine. Uh, another one is tea tree, which is a very strong, potent antifungal, and so it is used for athletes' feet and nail fungus. However, a word of caution, these essential oils are very potent, and they should not be used indiscriminately. So always ask your uh, health care provider, a certified aromatherapist, or, and do your research before using them. So another modality that we taught the staff was the Japanese art of Jin Shin Jitsu. And there is a handout that probably most of you have. And this use, the use of this is known to balance life energy in the body and helpful for the mind and help reduce pain in that way. <clears throat> and it is uh, based on the belief that each finger is connected to a meridian and an emotion and to a different organ in the body and emotion. So I invite you now to follow along with me in a demonstration. So everyone take their right hand and hold your left thumb. So we're just not going to squeeze real tight, but just a nice hug. And by holding the thumb, we send energy flow to the stomach, and we help cope with worry. 
And usually you hold for about two breaths and then pull off. Moving on to the index finger, this one helps us cope with fear and it also sends energy flow to the kidneys. Can everybody hold their middle finger? Can anyone guess what emotion might come up with the middle finger? Uh, anger. anger, that's right. And it sends energy flow to the liver. So that one's an easy one to remember. And hold your ring finger. And holding this helps us cope with feelings of sadness and grief and sends energy flow and balance to the lungs. And lastly, the little finger. It helps uh, send energy flow to the heart and helps us with feelings of insecurity and pretending to be something we're not and trying too hard. So we had an opportunity after showing these modalities uh, to the staff to show them uh, firsthand what, how effective they can be. While we were teaching the class outside in the common area in the hospital was a lady that was clearly in distress. She was just agitated, combative, and uh, in a lot of pain. And so we went out along with the staff and we gently placed our hands on her um, shoulders like Carolyn was demonstrating and did a little back massage. We also took some lavender oil under her nose and then I did some jinjitsu with her. And just within minutes, she calmed down. And the staff was very surprised by that. So in the weeks following the classes that we taught, we checked in with the staff to see how they were doing. And not only did they feel relaxed, but they said it made a big difference with their patients. The patients were more calm, less anxious, and they slept better. So that's just a testament to how powerful some of these can be. So in closing tonight, and, and as you learn about all the different modalities that we're teaching, I invite you to consider using them for yourself, your loved ones, and your patients. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michael Moore. I'm a medical Qigong practitioner, a retired social worker, and I'm happy to be working with Dr. Damon and the rest of the staff at Laguna Honda Hospital. It's really been um, a great thrill for me when I first started working there in 2013. I couldn't sleep the night before uh, my first day of working there because uh, I had been studying Chinese med medicine for such a long time. I hope to explain a little bit about what medical Qigong and Qigong is and how it works for patients. Uh, Dr. Damon showed us a slide of um, how acupuncture works in the body and um, how it affects the nervous system, the spine, and serotonin. The ancient Chinese, and this is a, probably about 5,000 years ago, didn't have the techniques to know that, or the language, or Latin, for, uh, to, to name some of these things. They um, had a different paradigm, and they observed in the body that all living things shared an energy. Now in India, they would call it prana. And different, uh, different ethnicities call this recognition of an energy force in all living things by different names. And the ancient Chinese called it qi. It could be spelled Q-I. Uh, C-H-I is an older way, and phonetically, C-H-E-E. -E. And qi is believed to be in every living thing, and it also incorporates every living thing into one body. And that includes the universe, the cosmos, um, the earth, everything known and unknown. And um, in the human body, chi flows through their paradigm borrowed from nature. So it flowed from large bays or bodies of water down to rivers and streams and in, into smaller pools. And in the human body, that would be the organs, meridians and channels, and acupuncture points. So medical qigong, or qigong, the practice of qigong, qi is energy, gong is the work of the energy, uh, is one of four branches of Chinese medicine, one being acupuncture, um, uh, herbal therapies, medical massage, and and uh, medical qigong. And being a medical qigong practitioner, 
I think we pro, uh, predated everything, but that's my bias. Um, so in the body, when there is a uh, deficiency of energy in any part of the body or a blockage, that is thought to be the cause of stress, discomfort, or pain. These um, blockages or deficiencies can be the result of an external uh, stimuli or an external factor like pollution, a trauma, an accident, or something in the environment. Internally, it can be caused by uh, stag stagnant, repressed emotions and uh, and some, some, some of the other uh, things that uh, stress, of course, can, can bring that on. So in the clinic, the uh, medical Qigong practitioner uses some diagnostic techniques using their hands in order to feel the energy in the body. The medical Qigong practitioner should be doing a home practice by, uh, on their own in order to cultivate energy in their body so that they can emit qi through their hands, through the palm of their hands, into an acupuncture point, along a meridian pathway, or into an organ that's as associated with, those, uh, with that meridian. Each meridian, there's 12 of them, 12 major ones, has, a, um, has an organ and a meridian and acupuncture points. So what we would do would be to try to clear a blockage or a stagnation in the body or tonify a deficiency. An excess of energy feels like two magnets put together, two of the same a pole of a magnet, two north poles, and you can feel the repelling. And sometimes you can feel it if you put your hands together and hold them two or three inches, try it. Hold it two or three inches, the center of the palm lining up with the center of the other palm, and if you pay attention and believe, um, you can feel a little repulsion. I can feel a little repulsion. So, um, Jennifer, please. And don't sit. Just come over to near to me and stand. So if someone comes into the clinic, oftentimes people come with many, multiple diagnoses. But what they present to me is usually joint pain. The back, the shoulder, the knee, maybe the ankle. So say if someone comes in with shoulder pain. I know from my studies that the organ that oversees ligaments and tendons is the liver. So I'll use my hand, which is called flat palm technique, and I'll just see to verify what they're telling me their symptom is. Because it could be something else. It could be a, a different root cause. And if it is, if I feel an excess of energy, a repulsion, and it doesn't, it could be heat, it could be cool, but most importantly, it's a pressure. And then I'll clean it out, meaning that I recognize that there is an energy around the body, two or three inches, that I most want to work with. There are other uh, levels of energy around the body as well, but I'm more interested in the one that's closest to the body, two to three, four inches. And then I'll work on the affected area itself and maybe stimulate some acupuncture points, open them as an acupuncturist would do, and in different points that I know that are along this channel, and then continue to clean, get out the stagnation, because I'm working under the theory that stagnation, that pain is because of the stagnation. And I double check it to see if there is a repulsion. And then after that, I will bring energy up my spine, out my hands, and then try to bring in fresh, clean chi energy, and then circulate the energy. And what we, what we usually try to do, uh, qigong practitioners, is also give um, 
give some homework prescriptions for uh, a client or a patient to do, because this will only set it for uh, maybe a day, unless there is repeated appointments. You know, three times a week would be great. Hardly any, anyone can afford the time or the money for that. But doing some homework prescriptions can help keep the balance and the flow of energy in the body and therefore mitigating pain, distress, and uh, discomfort. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jennifer. So good evening, everybody. My name is Alice, and um, I'm the music therapist in the clinic, and I also work at the Gunahan Hospital. So thank you, Michael. Basically, you know, he said whatever I'm going to say, so yes. But I would like to, I think before I kind of go into, um, so what I do in the pain clinic uh, um, is more with the sound therapy, with the acutonics. So, but one thing is kind of like got it from, you know, the, um, the talk before that I'd like to share um, is I think the, the reason make our clinic a pretty unique one is, um, I think we provide a lot of multi-sensory um, um, different of you know multisensory healing tools or healing system to the clients to the patients, and sometimes we think of um, pain, we just like so focus on the physical part, and kind of block you know like all our um, you know coworkers do kind of blocking all other things, so we do the touching, we do the you know smell. And then now I'm talking a bit more, more about the auditory, so kind of like to open that or ask sensory, you know, kind of the way to distract, you know, the pain. And this is just something I come up, you know, my team doesn't know that. So I would like to, you know, introduce, um, um, I'm doing acutonics and I also give out the handout. So a little bit more detail to talk about that and the information if you want to know more about um, this healing system. So now I just want to tell, you know, in my way, you know, inter interpret that. So basically, you know, this is a healing um, uh, system that using sound and combined with um, oriental medicine that uh, Michael kind of explained that. So, you know, we will <coughs> apply, um, you know, the tuning forks Either, you know, you will hear the sound. I don't know what you can hear here. Can you hear that? Yeah. So, you know, like different, we have different faults with different colors. And different colors have different sound. You know, you can. Yeah, so sometimes like, it's very dissonant sound. Sometimes can be. Yeah. So it's good. I like that. So, you know, so we either have you listen to that, you know, for your year, or we apply it, you know, so two ways we do that, you know, when we're pain. You know, we'll be like, you know, like Michael, we will, you know, because we also based on the acute, you know, pressure points, so we end with the meridian. So we will apply on different meridian points, you know, acupressure points. Or we do just uh, do it local, locally. So for example, you know, if you have shoulder pain, we will just put it on the shoulder. So the whole idea is um, because of music, you know, uh, therapy background, just think about we are, you know, a nice piece of instrument, a musical instrument. And um, somewhere if you're in pain, you are kind of, out of tune, you know, in that area, you know, because deal with the blockage of energy, you know, in the Orient, um, in our Ch and Chinese medicine saying. So, you know, using the sound, sound travel. So we're using the sound, you know, putting on different spot, you know, or in the meridian. Try to help, you know, to bring the balance or bring that little part of your instruments back in tune. So this kind of, you know, I, this is how I explain, you know, to the, to the resident, to our resident. And um, so um, I can have, you know, Jennifer just show a little bit. Yeah, have a seat. This one. So what I'm holding, this is called OM. This is, you know, for grounding and centering. So this sound. And a lot of residents, sometimes, you know, they just like to just listen to that, to this sound. Yeah. So usually I will this is how I would start that, put it um, next to her ear. So just let, you know, think about, just let your, 
and you, then usually I'll ask them to take a few nice deep breaths. Just, just think about your a sponge, those are the, you know, sucking into all this, you know, the sound. And then I'll put on different areas, and like I said, mm -hmm. I put it, you know, on different spot, and you can feel the vibration. So besides the auditory, also a tactile um, auditory. And I always like to end, you know, put it back in, in, in the heart. So using different kinds of force and have a different function. So that's how you know we do that. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Music therapists use music and various elements of music like rhythm, uh, timbre, melody, lyrics of songs, uh, to affect change in areas that may compromise someone's um, quality of life. And this could be in emotional areas, social areas, uh, education, and medical areas, including pain management. So there's a lot of reasons why music is especially effective with pain management. But one of them is that uh, research with using, uh, using M fMRI has shown us that when somebody listens to music, and even more so when they make music, um, they ignite all kinds of areas in the brain, not just auditory areas, but areas that control movement and planning movement, um, emotion, memories, speech. And so music is an incredibly good distraction from pain. Now, one of the hallmarks of this pain clinic is teamwork, and teamwork that extends to everyone in the room. Um, we spend a lot of energy community building. Uh, pain can be very isolating. Someone can feel very alone in their pain. But if we connect to each other, then our perception of pain changes and our ability to cope with pain changes. So one of the things that we do uh, to create community instantly in the pain clinic is sing together. So um, I'm hoping that all of you have a piece of paper on one side describes acutonics and on the other side has some song lyrics. There's nothing you can do that can't be done. Nothing you can sing that can't be sung. Acupuncture, I was 
told by one of my first teachers at UCLA when I was studying acupuncture. He said, I'm not sure what it is, but I know that I use needles to do it. So acupuncture is a needling thing. You gotta use a needle to do acupuncture. Otherwise it's acupressure or shiatsu, which is touching over the acupuncture points, the meridians. Well, once upon a time, uh, way back when I was asked to talk on a radio show about chi, energy, the thing we've been talking about here in the clinic. And I called one of my friends uh, who I'd gone to Tibet with and I said, hey, Leroy, you're an acupuncturist. Can you tell me what chi is? Because I got to talk on a radio. And he said, it's the simplest thing. Chi is anything you experience. It's what you're seeing right now. It's what you're hearing right now. It's what you're feeling right now. It's what you know right now. It's everything about you is, is energetic. And that's kind of an important thing because you know a lot of what I think Alice said about it's a multi-sensory experience in the clinic is really important. You know what we're doing is we're doing something that's mind-body, body-mind. That's nice because the acupuncture needle doesn't really distinguish between the mind or the body or the body or the mind. It just gets into the mind and the body all in the same way. I came to do the acupuncture in the pain clinic uh, by way of receiving acupuncture from one of the professors. So the uh, school is called ACTCM, American College of Traditional Chinese Medicine. And I wasn't really sure what to do when I got to the pain clinic with acupuncture, but when I visited her clinic, uh, I knew pretty much straight away is what I wanted to do, which is I wanted to practice community acupuncture. Community acupuncture meaning that you're actually being treated with a group of people. You're not alone in your room. And so what became clear was that this acupuncture form that was done in a circle was really community building. It was a way to get people together so that what was happening was a shared experience, which is a lot of what I hear everybody in our great team talking about is that we're sharing our team with the patient population, which comes to kind of see that it's the therapeutic environment, it's the therapeutic milieu, which is probably as important as anything that we do. What I do with my acupuncture is I do a, a protocol that's just a series of five needles in the ear. And um, Jennifer, if you don't mind sitting here for a second, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to talk loud enough so you can all hear what I'm saying. Yeah, why don't you come over here? That'd be even better. I can talk like that. So this, um, this protocol that I use for the patients in the pain clinic, it's called NADA, N-A-D-A, National Association of Detox Acupuncturists. And it's a series of five needles that go in the ear that was developed at Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx to take care of people who were having problems with addictions. And what the protocol did for those people with addictions is it made them feel much better about their addictions because they didn't have so many cravings, but it also made them feel incredibly more comfortable with all their anxiety and depression and pain, everything was going on. So what happens with these five needles is that I tell people, okay, take a nice breath, because breathing is energy. And when you start breathing, the energy starts flowing. Pain is essentially block, stuck energy. And what the needle is doing is it's helping to liberate the energy and release it and to flow around the body. So with these needles in the ear, the ear has a map of the entire body. And so what we do with these simple five needles in the ear is we put the first needle into a point that's related to the nervous system and related to the nervous system down-regulating, meaning that it's going to help to kind of become more relaxed and comfortable and take care of all the things that are kind of distressing about the nervous impulses that are creating pain in the body. So we'd put in a needle for the nervous system. Then we'd take a needle and I would put it in here and that would be for the heart. The heart's the organ that circulates the blood but with the blood circulates the chi, all the energy. And the heart's associated with joy. So when I put in the needle to the heart, I always say to people, it's a good place to actually start feeling the joy in your life. The next needle that goes in is for the kidneys the kidneys is basically the storehouse of all of the energy in the body. And it's also the place where when we don't have the proper kidney energy, we feel very anxious. And so the needle that's going into the ear is giving energy and taking care of anxiety. The next needle is for the liver, which helps to detoxify the body, but also takes care of anger. And the last needle that goes into the lung point is to help people breathe through the experience. Because again, the breathing is what creates the comfortability with the whole treatment that we're doing. And also the liver is what helps to release the grief. So again, mind, body, body, mind, each organ system has both a physiological function as well as an emotional function. So when we put the series of needles in while we're doing the massage, we're doing all the different treatments, what we're doing is we're creating this therapeutic environment for the person to have their block, stuck, painful energy liberated into feeling more comfortable 
with the treatments that we're doing in the clinic. So with that, I'm going to conclude. And Jennifer, who is right here right now, is the facilitator for questions that you might have in this last little bit of time that we have this evening. Thank you so very much. So Jennifer, do you feel better? <laughs> Actually, I always feel better when I'm with these people. I do. Yeah, so tonight's no exception. Yeah, the question was, do I feel better? Yeah. I wasn't sure if you were going to put the needles in my actual <laughs> ear, so I feel better now that that actually didn't happen because that can be a little intense for me. Yeah, what else? Are people anxious? How do they come in? It's a great question. Yeah. Um, I can answer that. So uh, what's interesting is we're coming into their home. You know, they live at Laguna Honda day after day, week after week, month after month. And they're referred and they choose to come. So I think one thing is the way that people enter is they've accepted an invitation. You know what I mean? And then also, they tell each other about the pain clinic. So like we've had people show up and say, well, you know, my neighbor told me to come because this will help you feel better. So, and, uh, and we don't go into great detail about the modalities like we have with you tonight. You know, we just invite them to come, we have a conversation, and then we give them the experience and they, they decide for themselves. Yeah. Michael, you have something to add? Sometimes the uh, individual gives over to the group, and that can help with the stress. But if there's other people here being treated, they feel a little, little bit comforted knowing that they're going to get something that helps. But sometimes, specifically, we can help things as well. As Dr. Reibold had mentioned, every meridian system is connected with an organ and an emotion. So at one time, Oh, a couple years ago, a gentleman came in and he was really angry. And he had an issue that he was angry about. It's usually the nurses or why am I here at Laguna Honda. And knowing that the anger issue is associated with the liver, I started treating his liver. So that was his, that was his emotion. And I just started treating and he was talking. And in about three or four minutes, he said, what are you doing? I'm not angry anymore. I knew I was angry about something when I come in, but I don't know what it is. And the insight I received from that was that anger had its own spirit, in a way. It had its own life. It really wasn't about the issue. It was almost like his anger was trying to find something to land on. But working with his emotion of anger, um, I could modify it a little bit. The same with anxiety in the heart or grief and other emotions. If I can add to that really quick. Um, so another aspect of um, being invited into the circle is we have other practitioners who um, didn't present here. So for example, Dr. Lukian is also here. Um, and she will often just make sure to say hello to everybody and make sure that they feel welcome and seen. So even if people are just kind of waiting their turn in the circle, everyone is, is really addressed and welcome. Jennifer does the same. We have other um, practitioners who, who kind of make the circle kind of just very welcoming. So. Thanks for that question. How do we treat people that are brokenhearted and depressed? And depressed? Well, um, with attention and a particular quality of attention, which I'd say is one of um, openness and uh, general acceptance that that's that person's type of pain. So we don't kind of, you know, say that pain's like unlike a different kind of pain. And then I think over time, what happens is people with a broken heart. Um, with good company, with time, uh, with energy work, uh, the heart mends itself. The heart is never the same again, but they say that uh, sometimes the heart breaks and when it mends, you know how when a jar is mended, it doesn't quite, if you glue it, it's not quite the same shape, it's slightly larger. So as a chaplain sometimes I think that um, as we heal from a broken heart, our hearts actually become stronger and bigger and we become more uh, compassionate. We can empathize more with other people. So that's what I've seen from a, a spiritual perspective around brokenheartedness. Yeah. Yeah. I think as a staff working at the Gunahan Hospital, um, we deal with a lot of, when we deal with patients with pain, 
I I would say a lot of time, not only the physical pain, and like you know what you said, we're dealing with a lot of psychological pain, pain of loss, you know, um, because a lot of a lot of residents, they might just come in, you know, with a very recent onset stroke, so it's a big, big loss of independence, you know, all that, and I think what we do is. Um, I would say simple like that in the clinic, we provide a little bit t more time to sit down and listen. And, and you know, some, although I would say, you know, like uh, Lagoon Hospital, you know, it's, uh, I will put my parents to this hospital, you know, but still that, t that quality of a time, you know, that might not have that. And I think the clinic, uh, itself just provide a little bit extra time, sit down and listen to them, and um, and we're not like just end there, you know, because uh, uh, you know we always will get feedback or if we need, you know, we will talk to the um, the the team, the medical team, you know, like Doctor uh, Damon or Doctor Rival, they will go back to the medical team and share what we, you know, what the residents share with us, and you know, then maybe that time. They need to do whatever, you know, like the pharmaceutical, you know, medicine. So we're not like totally ignore, oh, this is, that's what we're working. But I think we already talked how a little bit, you know, we're a little bit unique, you know, in different ways that maybe like in the, in the, rest, at the rest of the hospital, they're not able to provide. And just to piggyback on what Alice says, usually when someone comes in with a precipitating emotional problem, it's the tip of an iceberg. They may have had a long history of fractured families. They might be recently homeless or chronically homeless. They may have had drug addictions. And uh, we always, uh, I'm a social worker, so I'm nosy. And I ask questions and I ask people where they live and Where's, what's their family like? And I give myself license to do that. And so I will uh, want to know uh, how they're being treated on the unit. And Dr. Damon or Dr. Reibold will always check with the attending doctor on their unit and the nurses making sure that knowing that an emotion doesn't live by itself, it's part of the body as a whole and that other diagnoses are being addressed, either with physical therapy, occupational therapy, pharmacology, all the modalities that that, that hospital, Laguna Honda, provides, that they're well and balanced in those areas as well. And that can help modify their presenting emotion. Thank you. So I'm aware of the time. Did you have a follow-up question? We do, from time to time, have animals that come. And also at Laguna Honda Hospital, there is a, a, animals are a part of the um, activity therapy program that actually live on the property. Yeah. yeah, The most common one that we use in the clinic is a dog. So I'm aware of the time. I want to just look at my uh, colleagues here and see if there's anything that you want to add or have a sense. No? OK. And I'm going to look around the room. Great. So I'd like to offer a reading. Um, to close us out. Um, and before I do that, if we could each take a moment to um, consider somebody, yourself or somebody else, who has pain. Yeah, pain. Just bring that person to mind and imagine that uh, this reading is for them as well as for you. The great enemy of love is fear. The great enemy of love is fear. Fear contracts the heart. Its worries and anxieties stop the flow of love. Fear contracts the heart. Its worries and anxieties stop the flow of love. Do we really want to live in fear? Do we really want to live in fear? As the Persian poet Hafiz puts it, fear is the cheapest room in the house. Fear is the cheapest room in the house. I'd like to see you in better living conditions. I'd like to see you in better living conditions. So we all share the wish for happiness, and we can share that wish with others. 
and keep them in our minds and hearts as we continue through our evening, our days and weeks and months and lives. Thank you for your kind attention. And we'll all be here for a few minutes if you want to speak with any of us, okay?